please welcome to the stage Edwin Bautista, Executive Director, President and CEO, Union Bank. Stephanie Sai, CEO and Founder, Thinking Machines. And Bloomberg's Claire Jiao. Good morning, everyone. Um, so our panel is Revolution 4.0, and we really want to talk about how we can push the Philippines further into this fourth industrial revolution. And we have two people here who are doing exciting things with technology today. We have Edwin and Steph. Um, Edwin, I'll start with you. Mm. Union Bank has really broken away from the traditional banking model, saying no more physical branches. We'll focus on digital transformation. How do you get to that point, making that decision? And is that a difficult proposition to make to traditional stakeholders of the bank? Well, we started with the board of directors. So this was like three, four years ago. And we also had a consultant. We brought in a consultant. Uh, we brought in McKinsey, and their message was very simple. Digitize or perish. And uh, so for the last four years, we've been running this annual boot camp with our directors. We invite futurists. We, we got Brett King, who wrote Bank 3.0 and now Bank 4.0 to tell us where the world is moving. We, we brought in the founder of Ethereum. Uh, so we basically got thought leaders from around the world to tell us what's going on. Then after that, uh, I became CEO, and the former CEO, who's the chairman, is now spending a lot of time outside the country, engaging fintechs, finding out what the hell is going on, because our theory is if we keep on talking uh, with our peers, we will be lulled into thinking that this is the world and what today is will be the same and tomorrow will be the same as today. And we went out there, like for example, we even joined the Singapore FinTech Festival last year with a big booth. We're going to join again. But it opened our eyes to a different world. And uh, so when our colleagues say, well, Edwin, why, are you, why did you stop building branches? The branches are here to stay. We're building 50 more branches. I said, I'm closing some of my branches. I said, you know, but the world may not reach the Philippines. I said, you know, it's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Uh, and I could go on and on. We're talking about non-banks competing against us. And people are saying, no, that's not true. Uh, I said, well, what is banking? It's payments. It's loans. It's... Uh, getting savings products. But let's talk some payments. I was just showing my friends down there. The, the deputy governor talked about pushing NRPS, particularly this uh, uh, InstaPay. Insta -pay, yeah. Well, do you know who the number one InstaPay participant is? It's not a bank. It's Gcash. And the volume of Gcash in April alone was double the number two participant, which happens to be a bank. I mean, so it's here. Yeah, the revolution is here. The revolution yeah. is here. For Steph, you work with Thinking Machines, you work with some of the biggest conglomerates in the country, in Asia. When you talk to them, how do you convince them to pay attention to that revolution? And where does their reluctance usually come from? Um, well, usually at the point at which they call me, everyone's already a bit scared. Uh, so there is the drive. Um, so, so from um, the best practice is that data transformation comes after digital transformation. Uh, after a lot of our conglomerate clients have gone through a first round of digital transformation and realized like, oh my goodness, I'm generating a lot of data. Uh, I have direct touch points to my consumers now. How do I treat this data as an asset? Then they start thinking about, okay, data transformation, what does that mean? What do you do? Where do you go? Uh, the thing to remember that this is a pretty new practice. Uh, if you think about um, database technologies, they've been around since the 80s. There are um, best practices. Schools have a pretty good idea of what to teach uh, students. Um, IT managers who have 20 years of experience can be found. Uh, for digitization, uh, for digital technologies, it's been around since uh, maybe the 90s. Um, so you can find a coherent set of best practices in this space, but data, it's only been around for 10 years. 
Um, you don't have that level of senior talent available to you uh, where you as a chairman who doesn't have experience with tech can look at this person's resume, talk to them and say, okay, you're gonna do a great job running this billion dollar line. So it requires a lot more um, risk seeking, it requires a lot more innovation. I think the way you have to hire for this team, um, it's just very different. Um, so um, one common failing that I see is that uh, when conglomerates, and this has happened with some of my clients before they came and worked with us, uh, when they try to do a big bang style execution where they need to have their data platform fully planned out, they need to have um, everything budgeted for five years into the future, they fail because this field did not exist five years ago and how can you tell what's gonna happen five years from now? It's crazy. The best way to do it is um, kind of how Union Bank has been treating it as an innovation project. Um, innovation is 90% failure. If 90% of the things you're gonna try will fail, what you have to do is make the cost and time required to try an experiment as low as possible so that if you're running things in one week cycles, it doesn't matter if nine of 10 of those things fail, but if you're running things in five year cycles, failure is incredibly painful and will sink your business. Uh, so those fears are, I think, very valid and just require a different way of thinking and engaging with the world. Yeah, um, just so on that cost of digitization, Union Bank, you're one of the biggest spenders on IT among other banks, you spend about 15% mm -hmm. of your operating income on IT compared to only one to 3% for other big banks, it's a huge difference. How do you justify that upfront cost for returns that could really not pay off um, far on, in the near term? That's the challenge. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that's why we had to work on the board. We told them that it's gonna get bad on the expense side before it gets better. So you, you must have, I think, a view of how the world will be. Otherwise, all these technologies will be overwhelming. Where do I start? AI, uh, robotics process automation, blockchain. I mean, it can be overwhelming. So to us, the most important thing was uh, what is driving this change? And we realized that throughout history, banking is really about improvement in two things. One is the friction cost. And second is the speed at which transactions get executed. We've been, you know, banking's been around since the time of the Medici, since the time of the Templars. The big revolution before was ATM. So all of a sudden, you could bank 24, 24 hours. And that was Bank 2.0. Then you had mobile banking. Now you can bank anywhere. And in both in these cases, it had the impact of either reducing the transaction costs or increasing the speed. But now, so now nothing has changed except that when we're talking of reducing friction costs, we're talking of zero marginal costs or achieving close to zero marginal costs. And then you have a competitor like Globe giving it away for free. And uh, here's a bank who's used to making 100 pesos per transaction of a million transactions a month. You have to think very hard to you know, to, to, to match them. Then the second one is speed of execution. There was a time when to get a loan would take you 10 days, 15 days, 20 days. And with all these algorithms right now, it's on a click of the cell phone because the algorithms have already predicted whether, one, whether you could be approved or not. And worse, they can even predict when, you, when they think you're going to ask for a loan. So that's what we're up against. And that, once you recognize that the world is moving there, you have to retool and rebuild your bank and ask, how am I going to compete in a world where we have two things, near zero marginal cost, and second, the time to completion is near zero. Then I need to change everything at the back end. Now, I can believe it's not going to happen, or I can say it's going to happen, and I will be among the survivors if it happens. Uh, one of the things is, which uh, I, 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 I like with Globe, is they're saying, don't look, don't look at us as a competitor. Um, work with us together. The market is big enough. And we're one of those who have taken that approach. And true enough, they're hitting a market which we traditionally have not. So what's the point? Of course, some of my colleagues say, well, 
you give them one hand and before you know it, they'll eat the whole body. So they'll start with the lower end and start to move up. But we'll worry about that. Anthony is shaking The his market head. is big he enough. He says no. He says no. <laughs> no? Um, Steph, you work a lot with big data. How, how rich has data become in the Philippines enough to be transforming business models for your clients? Right. So I think big data is such an interesting um, mindset to embrace because it's not correct. You don't need big data. You need, smart, you need to be smart about the data that you have. Um, and I think there's two elements to that to consider. Uh, first is um, you can build machine learning models on very little, almost no data at all. Um, some types of machine learning models. For example, um, I've built a model uh, where um, basically hundreds of scanned documents processed by each um, legal assistant a day, and I just need to check to see if there's signatures on each page. I don't need any training data. I really just need like five documents where I can teach the machine to recognize the signature, and then that's a full end-to-end -end AI model deployed for you. Um, the other thing to consider is that um, to be smart about your data, you need to think about building data platforms. Um, so the big phrase maybe 10, 15 years ago was data warehouse. Do you have your data warehouse, a way to take all your different business units, data silos, uh, put them in one organized space? Uh, then now people call it a data lake. You know, sometimes I think a better word for it is data garbage dump because that's what it feels like. Yeah. You just like toss it all in there. Uh, it's not organized. It doesn't make any sense. You can't join it across the different silos. And that janitorial work drives a huge amount of value. Data, you cannot have your data as an asset if your data lives in a garbage dump. I really want to be clear about that. Um, but once it's there, great. You're starting to do uh, daily reporting, historical reporting on your um, on, on what you have, then you start getting more sophisticated. You want to run machine learning models on top of this data. Uh, you're getting really great reports. Then you want to direct it to your consumers. So great, my machine learning model is predicting um, who's, gonna, uh, who's gonna commit fraud or not, right? Um, how do I, in real time, integrate it with my digital applications? Then you start thinking about this data platform, not just a, as a historic analytical record, but, but as a tech product in itself. Um, and once you've gone through that whole evolution from historical to real time to running reports to being able to attach it to API endpoints and hit digital, uh, then I think you have a fully sophisticated um, platform running. But I just want to make a comment. Uh, when we were there in the other room, and I think also just a few minutes ago, Steph here said data science is about 10 years old. Yeah, uh, it's 10 a baby. years old. And the reason she's thinking 10 years old because that's the number of years she's been out of college. But, but just to demystify it, and uh, my professor down there, Dicky Gonzalez, can vouch for this. 30 years ago in college, we were already learning linear programming, we were already doing linear regression. Now, so when I talked to our data scientists, I said, they, I asked them, what are the tools? Oh, they said, random forest. Well, I have not heard of that before. Decision tree, well, that sounds uh, familiar. Then they said, regression. I said, my God, I, I, I taught for one year in college because I'm an engineer. And, I, and one of the subjects I taught was uh, regression analysis, line of best fit. And then I realized that it's no different. The science is already there. The math is there. The difference is, and I was sharing this with my old, my, my, not old, but my former professor, that <laughs> before it used to take a whole exam booklet just to come up with the solution to one formula. And that would take like three hours of exam. And you make one mistake and you have to start all over again. And you get, so it's a zero or nothing exam. But now that computing power has reached a stage, we can do multiple, you know, different iterations of the same thing. That has changed. I think that has what has revolutionized it. And also the data that's available lends itself to this kinds of, uh, of things. I want to push back a yeah. little bit though because yeah. I think that uh, regression models have been around for a long time and the math behind, uh, let's say neural networks, yeah. has been around since the 80s. Uh, but if you take a look at the academic papers being published at uh, machine learning conferences over the last 10 years, things have been changing really hard, really fast. Um, think about these image recognition models. I promise you could not do that like 20 years ago. Um, and the uh, natural language processing models. Oh, yeah. And I still see the speed of change increasing. So um, it, it's both things. Um, 
the computing power is getting more sophisticated, the uh, models are getting more sophisticated, and I want to add the third thing. It's not just about bigger servers and bigger machines, but um, more complex technology products, which require infrastructure thinking of a different type. So the science has always been there, maybe moving at a pace we've never seen before. Is the skill set there, though? You mentioned manpower bottlenecks that you've faced for both companies. Well, I guess what she was saying was because the yeah. tools are there, you explore new and additional uses. I mean, like, for example, before we would put everything in a, in a report, you know, that in a table. Now, these data scientists wow us with all these graphics and movement oh, the customer moves from this place to that place, and, 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 and it's, it's kind of amazing. And, uh, it, of course, at the very least, it impresses the board. And most of our board members are between 60 to 70, and, and they get blown away. And that's the piece that they love so much. So whenever we, we make presentations, I said, I want one of those moving yeah. things, you know, yeah. where it's yeah. dynamic, and, it's, and that's, that's what turns them on. And actually, that's the least actionable of it. But, uh, well, you know, you, you get it. The problem really is, you know, you have these machines trying to find patterns. Now, here's the challenging piece. So our data scientists say, look, this is what you guys have been doing. You know, you eyeball the statistics. And then because of your 30 years of stock knowledge and experience, you try to look at patterns in the business, and then you guys decide. Then this young kid tell us, you know what? Machines can do a better job than you in finding patterns. That's when the older ones sh shut off. Um, so those are the challenges. So we see that all the time. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's the biggest challenge. No, yeah, I agree. Because it's you're not just changing the tech platform, right? You're changing the way people work. And uh, you're not, it's not just isolated to your IT team, it's across the whole company. So that actually requires um, talent from two sides. One is young talent trained in, uh, trained in these technologies. And um, my numbers are terrible because, um, okay, there are only 10 people who graduated from the UP Masters in CS program last year and eight from the LaSalle Masters in CS program. 18 people out of the 120 million Filipinos uh, there are living here today. I'm just like, wow, here's my hiring pool, really. And how many did you hire? Three. <laughs> how many did you hire, Evan? Well, total or last, from this pool? In the last three years, we hired 30, <laughs> right, John? 30. Yeah. So, I mean, if we put those that many, my you God, between you and me, no, there's, not enough, uh, it's gone. <laughs> there's not enough in the market. Um, so, the, that, that young talent, I think, I really, if you gave me a billion dollars, I would put it all in education. I would really put it all, not, not in teaching kids how to think, uh, not in teaching kids how to code, but in teaching them how to think, because tech changes, right? If you have critical thinking, if you're quantitative, you'll change with the times. Um, but the second type of talent is people who are in, people have to believe that they can keep growing and learning forever. People in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, they have to believe that they can keep growing and learning. Because, you know, you sign our checks. <laughs> Where's Ernest? <laughs> yeah. He signed a couple of my checks. So. Okay. okay. Um, but yeah, working together with subject matter experts that understand their, their space well. You know, it's um, you can't just hire a data science team, throw them into the throw them out into the wild and say like, come back in three months, and they come back and they're gonna show you stuff you already know because we've only yeah. been out of college for. 10 years. 10 years, 10 years. <laughs> um, so the best teams that I've worked with, um, you know, here in the Philippines, we do a lot of work with Globe, with Maralco, and for both these teams, they always put in a senior leader with us, somebody who has real expertise and knowledge, somebody whose time is pretty expensive, to be honest. Um, they help guide the, um, they help tell us when the machine learning model is telling them something really obvious. It's like, great, let's dig in. What's less obvious? Uh, help us figure out how to get to a place where we're really driving like 30% um, lift in your uh, marketing campaigns. And we have achieved that number um, quite a few times. And that's, that's really teamwork. That's really, um, yeah, that's really the best way to run anything in life. Edwin, I wanted to ask you about blockchain because it is something Union Bank has really been focusing on. Lots of potential, lots of novelty also there, but um, a hot debate about uh, how many use cases we can really get out of it. Can you talk to us about what you've found so far? Blockchain, if you look at the Gartner Hype Curve, 
has has moved from what last year was thought to be the next internet revolution into some period of disillusionment where people are saying, well, it's not living up to the promises. But but I can tell you that if you are in the market, a lot of use cases are being developed right now. And in the next six months, you're going to see a an explosion of blockchain executions. Uh, I think all, nearly all clearing systems around the world will be on blockchain. I and mean, that's a fearless forecast. Uh, the stock exchanges will all be on blockchain. Uh, we ourselves have done a lot of blockchain products, but that's not a problem. So here we are, uh, our chairman of the board uh, volunteered to be chairman of the Blockchain Association of the Philippines, goes around showing our mining rig and talk about uh, blockchain. Then we launch our projects and guess what? Not enough blockchain developers. And then we also hear that China is looking for, we'll need what? 100,000, a million blockchain developers. My God, they're going to sap all the developers in the world. And so what we did was we launched the Blockchain Institute and we trained for six months 100 people. Okay, so we just graduated them um, two months ago. And, uh, and we were, it's a unique program in that they did practicum work. They actually did real work for us. And we paid them for the work. And out of the 100, there was not a single drop-off. Uh, there were 3,000 applicants. We selected 100. 30 we hired outright. 30 are working as freelancers with us. And then the other 40 are, most of them are already in China. <laughs> Do you have the same fearless forecast, Steph? Uh, for, uh, for blockchain and big data. Um, honestly, I, I, I've got to say, like, I, I'm an AI ML person. I don't know that much about blockchain. All I know is that I wish I'd mined some back in 2004, <laughs> bitcoins, I mean. <laughs> um, but I do think that um, new technologies like blockchain, I, I think the, what Union Bank did is the perfect way to train up talent. Like, searching for it is actually so much harder and more expensive than um, investing in training them in the technologies you want them to understand. And if you lose a percentage, you know, so be it. Uh, but hey, you got 30 developers. Well, I think the secret there is you can't, the old approach of doing everything yourself cannot work. So even with 30 data scientists, we always are looking for uh, outsource providers, people like you, and I hope you do come and work with us on certain <laughs> projects. Uh, because it always injects new thinking. We, you know, we have 30 people if we don't inject fresh blood every three months, we'll be obsolete in a year. So we recognize that. And also working with partners in the fintech world, that's very important. You know, banks think, well, you know, we have this buzzword, we need to unlearn, learn and relearn. Uh, unlearn, learn, well, in that order. And uh, you know, we're supposed to be experts in lending. Well, guess what? There are people who are lending to people who we thought we will not make money on, and they're making money, like my friend here, Zenik, in front. So, I mean, and we're supposed to be the experts, so the first thing is we need to recognize that we have a lot to learn from the others, right? So if we have the attitude that as a bank, we have superior credit skills, underwriting skills, that's the, that's the end of us, because that's a straight path to, to death. So we work with them. Right, I, partner? I guess as a last question, what do you think are the low-hanging fruits or the next steps that we see in digitization? What sectors do you think are ripe for the taking? Steph, do you want to start off? Yeah, um, so I've seen um, digitization is still pretty much in its early stages. I've seen um, in the Philippines, um, you know, retail, airline, banking, but Again, as Mr. Edwin said, the future is here. It's just not distributed evenly. In every single one of these sectors, you maybe we have one, maybe two uh, people who've gotten it figured out, and everybody else really should be a fast follower. Um, like you know, um, in in innovation, um, if you're not the leader, you can be the fast follower, and in some ways, it's better to be the fast follower. You've already seen these other guys succeed, fail. 
um, and you can run and take all their best practices, take everything that they've learned and go with it. So um, the big thing that I see is that in every sector where you're seeing a number one uh, leader in digitization, everybody else, if they're smart, ought to be like running for it. Um, I think that it's harder to say where um, there are some sectors where it's like totally unknown. So for example, I think that the real estate sector is really interesting because traditionally they haven't been um, a ripe ground for digitization because your transactions are slow, you have your um, separate databases, separate databases, different organizations. Yeah. yeah, and you have you don't have that many transactions. Like how many pieces of property do you have? Like a couple thousand. It's not like millions of um, purchases or millions of um, remittances. Um, but what I do think is interesting is as the Internet of Things starts to become more prevalent here, and, and I'm talking about, um, so digitization is very much mobile phone, desktop, computer based. Um, when I'm saying Internet of Things, I'm saying um, sensors on your phones that track your geospatial location. I'm saying smart cities, smart tolls, uh, ways to um, do national geographic monitoring um, with ways data, satellite imagery, and so on, then your data set on geospatial gets much richer and the options for interacting with people, not just through their phones, but through their built physical environments, uh, then becomes really interesting. Imagine um, the house talking to you, the mall talking to you as you come in. Um, I think it's much closer than it was and I'm pretty excited about the options for um, geodigitization, I guess. Um, I think that's gonna be very yeah. interesting. Edwin. My parting shot. Uh, but let me share with you a secret. You know, you are the future of banking. Anthony there, he, he has the largest transaction count in, uh, in the bank ACH, double the biggest bank, and he's giving it away for free. Now, He's a businessman. He's not gonna. You'd say, well, why is he giving it away for free? The money is in credit. The money is in lending. Now, but we need to figure out a way of predicting when they will borrow, predicting whether they will pay or not, and that's all going to be up to you. If you can unlock that whole secret, that holy grail, that perfect algorithm that gives us great confidence that someone who applies for a loan gets a loan right after he clicks a button and gets the money, you're gonna clean up the market. And that's what most of the payment fintechs are trying to do. We we're already seeing that in China. And when that happens, boy, don't you think the banks could get wiped out? I mean, it's so easy to see, and that's what we're afraid of. Now, so what's our defense? We want to participate in that game as well. Now, the fintechs are open to participate for inviting us to participate. But we need, but they always say, but I must be able to interface quickly with you. Where are your APIs? Do you have an API platform that I can tap today? My answer is yes. And that's why uh, we, they work uh, a lot with us. Next, we're nimble, we're fast, we're agile. Are you? So we need to transform internally. So that's, those are the transformations that we need to do. So when we talk about digital transformation, it's not just a technology, it's the total package. Having an overlay that's lipstick on a pig. You've got to retool the entire backend. Otherwise, it won't work. You will be digitally transformed on the outside and analog in the inside. I think, Edwin, you can expect a proposal from Thinking Machines pretty soon then. <laughs> Actually, she told me that she already did. It's on your desk, sir. <laughs> on your desk. Wait.